Alright, good evening. I'm sorry, I was just doing a few things there. My name is Pastor Russell Huggins, and um, you're with uh, the Rome Seventh-day Adventist Church uh, Facebook feed, and we welcome you uh, to our study here tonight, and uh, we thank you for joining us. This is actually a, um, a, a follow-up, or not really a follow-up, but a... Um, uh, in addition to our Breaking Bread class that we do on Wednesday evenings, uh, we decided not to do it at the church this evening for various reasons, but uh, I just want to um, uh, include uh, a few things here tonight before we get started. Um, our, our brother uh, Darwin, Chef Darwin, has made a few things tonight, and uh, he wanted to, to share those things with us. I don't know if I can share my screen, but... Uh, I don't think I'm going to be able to because I don't see a share screen option. So, um, nevertheless, I want to just share with you a few things about what we what we made for uh, tonight. And uh, we did some Mediterranean pasta and breadsticks. My wife made some breadsticks, and they were delicious, albeit that we didn't eat them at the church. Uh, but um, the uh, the Mediterranean pasta has some ingredients. We'll try to post those on, uh, in the description or underneath the video um, when we're finished and um, uh, we'll add those as well as some olive oil, uh, some benefits of olive oil um, and how it helps uh, improving cardiovascular system, your cardiovascular system. Uh, obviously that's your heart. Uh, it prevents stroke, there's a reduction of depression risk, uh, reduces breast cancer, uh, there's a maintain, it maintains healthy cholesterol levels, uh, protects the liver from oxidative stress. Uh, protection from ulcerative colitis, so from ulcers, uh, curing Alzheimer's, um, and it certainly probably has some uh, uh, benefits to help um, alleviate some of the, the, the difficulties with uh, Alzheimer's, but um, as well it can uh, help cure or lead to um, better results in acute pancreatitis, and also can help re re relieve constipation. Now, I want to make a mention here about oils in general that um, you don't want to eat too much oil uh, because there are um, some some risk factors involved with that. That the the um, the natural oil that's found in olives and in avocados is actually um, uh, beneficial because it's in little tiny sacks, uh, fat sacks, and the refining process by which most oils are are made. So you know, your canola oil, your vegetable oil, olive oil, all these different types of oils that they make. Um, the, the, the refining process breaks those bags open and allows the fat to come out and that fat can actually enter into your uh, bloodstream and clog your capillaries and, and arteries and other things like that and reduces the ability for the blood to uh, transfer to um, your, your, your mind, uh, to, your, to the different organs of your body and thus you're going to be um, uh, getting less oxygen, less nutrients, less uh, overall of everything that is positive and good for the, the different organs of your body to get these um, uh, get the proper nutrition or to get oxygen and blood flow to those areas so um, you know taking in fat in its natural state such as like I mentioned in all and the natural olive off the tree or in avocados or coconuts and things like that a lot of people say it's bad for you uh, but it's actually not because it's not refined you got to watch out for that refined stuff so I would, I would suggest, even though there are some benefits to olive oil, um, that we, we certainly limit the intake of uh, the amount of olive oil that we do consume. Um, we don't want to douse our salad in. In fact, I try to eat my salads um, without any uh, dressing or um, uh, you know, oils on them because what it does is it actually will coat the inside of your stomach, which prevents um, the acids from coming in and breaking down that food. And thus, the it will sit in the stomach and uh, ferment. Um, and you don't want to you don't want a, a nice healthy salad going in your gut and then fermenting in your gut uh, for the next day or so. So, um, and uh, so that's that is uh, kind of the the idea behind it. Um, and like I said, oils plug up the the capillaries and vessels in your in your body as well. So, um, just just try to be careful with the amount of oil that you take in. And um, uh, and we want to just encourage you to eat eat healthy, eat smart, um, eat fewer uh, you know not calories, but eat fewer um, uh, you know calories that are 
from saturated fats and things that, of that nature. Um, just just be cautious. I'm not going to say everything in moderation because that's uh, that's not really a good um, uh, line to live by. Uh, albeit that uh, the Bible does say that uh, God wants us to prosper and be in good health even as your soul prospers. So my friends, God wants you to prosper. God wants you to give you wants to give you an abundant life, and we can't have the, that abundant life if our bodies are in a weakened condition and we are unhealthy. In fact, the Bible says that we can give God glory through what we eat and what we drink in the Book of Corinthians. So we, there is a way that we can give God glory through what we eat, and there's a way that we can not give God glory by what we eat. So we need to find out and be discerning about those things, and the Bible is very clear about a lot of this. But that is not the topic for our study tonight. The actual the topic for our study tonight is actually the Witch of Endor. We're going to be talking about um, the state of uh, the state of the dead. So where do the dead go when they die? Where, do, do do people go to heaven or hell when they die, or do they uh, do they stay in the grave? What happens? Um, uh, to us when we die? Do we become disembodied spirits that go into the spirit world? Do we come come back and are we reincarnated as an animal or a monkey or whatever it may be? Um, you know, so there are many thoughts uh, going around about these things, but we're going to try to limit it um, to just the Bible here tonight because um, the Bible declares about itself that it is the inspired word of God, that it is only the only source, the authoritative, the only authoritative source uh, for truth in our uh, generation. In fact, many would say, well, you know, truth is subjective to me. And we may not say that outwardly, but um, subconsciously we say, well, my truth is right because I believe it's right. Uh, but that's, that's not, that's not a, a, a testable source of truth. We must have a testable source of truth, and the Bible is testable. Um, there's many things that we can test in the Bible. We can test test the Bible by archaeology. We can test the Bible by science. We can test the Bible with mathematics. We can test the Bible with, with um, uh, psychology. We can test the Bible with um, physiology. Uh, the Bible has been an accurate source of, of truth uh, for, for all time since, since the Bible came into being. So uh, we want to turn to the pages of Scripture and find out what the Bible says about truth. But before we go there, let's have a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to open your word. We ask and pray that you would bless each person that comes on and that watches this video, Lord, that you would uh, encourage them to, to seek out the truth, Lord, and not just any truth, not the truth of, of the psychologists and the doctors and the men of this age, Lord, but may they seek out that wisdom that is above, that is peaceable and gentle and it's, it's full of love. And Lord, we just ask and pray for your guidance and lead, your leading tonight. As we open the pages of Holy Writ, that you would open our eyes and our, under, our ears to your understanding, that we may um, see more clearly, and that we may taste and see that you are good to us. We thank you, Father. We ask these things, and we lift them up in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, I'm sorry. I, w I would like to have some interaction. I know there's some interactivity options. If you do have a question, you can... Um, uh, uh, I do believe you can add a question in there. Um, yeah, so I've got a question thing here. So I've got my screen here. So if you have a question, you can enter it in the box, and we'll try to answer that for you. So, and this is obviously during the live feed. So let's go back into the, into the Bible to uh, to about three or four thousand years ago to the story or the book of First Samuel chapter twenty eight. First Samuel chapter twenty eight. This is the story of King Saul, the first king of Israel. And uh, King Saul was at his wit's end, and he was trembling with fear. The entire Philistine army had gathered to attack Israel's smaller and weaker troops. Saul mo moaned, if only Samuel were here, he would tell me what to do. But the great prophet of Israel had died a few years earlier. The aged monarch tried desperately to find some advice or guidance from other prophets or priests, but the Lord would not speak to him. In fact, the Bible says that the Lord would not speak to him uh, by uh, by Urim or Thummim. In fact, it says here, uh, let me see if I can find it. Um, uh, give me a second. Um, it's right here in chapter 28, but I'm not seeing it here. Excuse me. Uh, but nevertheless, he says that, uh, he, that the Lord did not speak to him via Urim or Thummim. 
either by prophet or by um, uh, other various sources. So Saul went out after the only thing left. And we're going to talk to that, that here tonight. Um, but as, as a young man, Saul had been close to God. But after ascending the throne, he became cruel and rebelled against God, uh, God's word. Once he even had a whole village of priests murdered in order to get, after, get at David. King Saul had persistently refused to listen to the Lord. And now in his distress, God would not answer him. Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit. In fact, women were actually uh, used more often than not for uh, uh, conjuring spirits because they had a closer connection with uh, their, their emotions than did men. And, and so women were often uh, uh, were gone to in order to uh, speak to the spirits and to the spirit world. But um, it, it's not always safe to go to those things. Um, so he says, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And that's First Samuel 28, verse 7. God had clearly commanded his people never to consult a witch or a medium in Leviticus 19, verse 31. And we're going to talk about the reason why. But Saul now had little regard for God's implicit instruction. And uh, so, uh, upon finding a woman in Endor, he claimed to consult with the dead. The king disguised himself and went to see her. He said to the medium, Bring me up Samuel. The witch went through her spells and enchantments until an apparition claiming claiming to be Samuel, the prophet, appeared and gave the king an utterly hopeless message. It predicted that Saul and his three sons would die in the battle the next day. The following day, Saul's sons were slain by the Philistines, and afterward, the wounded and discouraged king fell on his sword and took his own life. So, the question we must ask, who spoke to Saul through the witch? A resurrected prophet of God or a devil in disguise? And that's going to be the topic for tonight. So, um, if you got your Bibles, uh, turn with me there, and we're going to dig into this. So, was the form that Saul saw actually Samuel the prophet? Um, let's look at um, 1 Kings chapter 22. I know we just said we're going to go to 1 Samuel. We're going to come back to that. 1 Kings chapter 22. And let's take a look here. 1 Kings 22 and verse 22. I'm going to get there and I'm going to read it. So hopefully if, you know, when you watch this later, you can just pause it and um, go to there and then we can keep going. So some, or Isaiah, or sorry, 1 Kings 22, 22. And the Lord said unto him, wherewith, wherewith? And he said, I will go forth and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, you shall persuade him and prevail also. Go forth and do so. Um, so in Revelation 16, verse 14, the Bible says, For they are the spirits of devils working miracles. So the Bible says that the devil, the devils can work miracles. That's in addition to what God can do. So if devils can work miracles, then we've got to be careful about what we, who we trust and what we trust. So uh, do the dead come back to converse with or to haunt the living? Let's turn to Job 14. Job 14, verse 21. Um... And that's just before the book of Psalms, Job 14 and verse 21. The Bible says here, His sons came to honor, and he knows it not, and they are brought low, but he perceives it not of them. So, uh, in Ecclesiastes 9, 5, verse 5, 6, and 10, it says, The dead know not anything, neither have they any more reward, uh, reward for the memory of them is forgotten. Um, and, and it goes on to say a few other things here. Give me a second to go there. i get there again. Um, Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 5 and 6. It says uh, that the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. And verse 10 says, Whatsoever thy, thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave where you go. So, the Bible is clear. A dead person does nothing and knows nothing about what is happening on earth. In Psalms 115 verse 17 says, The dead praise not the Lord. In Psalms 6 verse 5, In death it says, There is no remembrance of thee. In Job 7 verse 10, uh, The Bible says, He shall return no more to his house. So if someone, something is coming to your house and claiming to be your dead grandmother or grandfather or son or daughter or mother or father or whoever it may be in your family or even 
uh, Pachalene Angel, and they're saying that they're, they're dead, raised back to, that, that they've come back to give you a message, be very careful. Be very careful. The Bible says in John, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1 that we are to test the spirits to see whether they are of God. So how do we test that we know that, that the dead don't come back? We need to go to the Word of God. We need to check it by, by God's Word. Um, in Isaiah 38, 18, the Bible says, Death cannot celebrate thee. Psalms 146, verse 4, the Bible says that the, the one person who dies, his thoughts perish. Um, so according to the book of Revelation, who has the keys of death? Let's turn to Revelation 1 and verse 18. Those of us who know the Bible uh, very, fairly well, we know that the Bible says, that, this is speaking of Jesus. Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, it says, I am he that lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and had the keys of hell and of death. Now, the Bible, uh, my Bible puts this in red letters, which the red letters um, often refer to the words of Jesus, uh, but it's only Jesus is the one that lives and was dead. He was the one that was resurrected, um, and he is alive forevermore because he is God. Um, so the Bible is clear, only Jesus has the keys of death. The devil cannot raise the dead. He cannot create life. Only God can create. The Bible says that God alone is the creator of the heavens and the earth. So we should go to his word for answers about questions, to our questions about death. Let me say it that way. So how did God make man in the beginning? Let's go back to the book of Genesis, which this is, the uh, book of Genesis is often a very, um, uh, you know, it's a book that people don't like to read and don't they think it's full of fairy tales and lies and uh, untruths and things of that nature. But um, I, I believe in the book of, uh, of Genesis. I believe in the whole Bible. And I believe that Genesis speaks to our origins that um, we don't come from apes, aliens, but we came from um, Adam by the hand of God. So how did God make man in the beginning? Genesis 2 verse 7. And notice the wording here. It says, and the Lord God formed a man of the dust of the ground. All right, so we have one part of the, the, the thing here, the one part of the formula, dust. All right, dust of the ground. And notice it says, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Okay, so dust, this is our mathematical formula, dust plus breath equals what? Let's take a look. It says, uh, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now, I don't know about you, but if man became a living soul, that does not imply that man has a soul. That's very clear. The Bible says that man is a soul. And in fact, the Bible, we can look it up elsewhere if you're questioning that. In Ezekiel chapter 18, if you turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 18, in fact, good Bible study is to use the Bible as its own interpreter, not to interpret my ideas or my opinions through the Bible. Uh, or, uh, you know, the Bible through my opinions, let me say it that way. But rather, we need to use the Bible as its own interpreter. That is a good Bible study. Uh, we use the Bible to, to corroborate itself. So in Ezekiel chapter 18, notice in verse 20, it says, The soul that sins, it shall die. Now, wait a second. If a soul is, is um, can be, or if a man has a soul, and when he dies, that soul goes to heaven, then how did the, how does the Bible how do you explain this verse that says the soul that sins it shall die? Uh, that's that's a, that's a challenge because the Bible the Bible says that we became a living soul when God made us from the dust of the ground and breathed into us the breath of life. We became a soul, therefore our soul can die. I think that's very clear here. You can also look at. Um, uh, verse uh, verse 4, Ezekiel 18, verse 4, it says, Behold, all souls are mine. He's speaking of men. All men are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sins, it shall die. Very clear. So, we understand that God um, uh, did two things. That God formed man from the dust, and he breathed into him the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Not man had a soul. But man became a soul. So what happens at death? Let's turn back to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And let's take a look at verse 7 here. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 7. My friends, the Bible is littered with truth. 
The problem is, is that so many pastors have, have deceived their, their, the, their people, the, those who uh, trust in them, and told them that, well, your dead loved one is in heaven because that sounds like a better place to be than hell. But either place you put them is incorrect at death. The Bible is very clear that when, the, when you die, you, don't, you go into the grave. And in fact, the word hell actually means Sheol or Gehenna or Hades, which is uh, the Greek terms, uh, aside from Sheol, Sheol is the Hebrew term, but the Greek terms for the grave. Um, that's what the Bible determines the, the, the hell and Hades and Sheol and Gehenna and all these things. It means the grave, death. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7, the Bible says, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Notice that. The dust shall return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. God, the Spirit, in essence, is connected with the, the breath of life. God's breath is Spirit. It's life. So what takes place at, place at death is the opposite from what happened during creation. The body returns to dust, and the spirit or breath returns to God who gave it, as we just read. The Bible clearly teaches that the spirit, spirit that returns to God, is simply the breath of life, which God breathed into man in the beginning. Um, you can read a couple of verses here, James 2.26, um, and Job 27, verse 3, and these are all marginal, as well as Job 33, verse 4. But notice in Psalms 104, verse 29 and 30, it states, Thou takest away their breath. They die and return to their dust. You send forth thy spirit or breath, and they are created. So breath is the creative life force that God puts in man in order for to animate the body of dust. I hope that is clear. Um, you know, when Jesus went to the tomb, and I want to I want to focus this topic in Jesus because when Jesus uh, went to the cross and died, Jesus didn't go anywhere but the grave. His body didn't go to heaven or hell. It went into the grave. And in fact, the angel came down and resurrected that body on resurrection uh, the, on the first day of the week, Resurrection Sunday. So if Jesus' body left the grave, you know, it seems kind of counterintuitive that uh, the, the body would be back in the grave on Sunday morning. But then we could argue, well, it wasn't his body, it was his spirit. Well, what did Jesus say about after he was resurrected, Mary Magdalene came to him? And he said, uh, he, she went to touch him, and she, he said, Do not touch me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. Um, there's a problem there. If Jesus hadn't ascended to the Father, then where did Jesus go at his death? A, you know, a, other than the grave. That's a question for you to ponder and to think about, but um, nevertheless... Um, some argue that based on uh, erroneous uh, uh, pretexts of, of scripture that um, that he went to, to, to visit the spirits in in, uh, in in hell in the book of Second uh, Peter, but that's not what the book of Second Peter is talking about. The book of Second Peter is talking about this, those people who lived before the flood, um, and that the Holy Spirit ministered to them, not the Spirit of Christ. Anyway, so. Where do the dead go when they die? Let's turn back to Job 21. Job 21 and verse 32. Job 21 verse 32. And like I said, if you have questions, uh, you can um, ask. You can ask uh, any questions there in the in the comments section, or um, if, if you do have something that you want to say. So, Job 21 verse 32. Notice what the Bible says here. Job 21 verse 32. Yet shall he be brought to the grave, and shall remain in the tomb. Did Jesus go to the tomb? Well, if Jesus left the tomb sometime between his death and his resurrection, that means the Bible is lying. And it's untrue, and we should not believe it. But if Jesus stayed in the tomb, as we know he did, then the Bible is correct, and that when you die, you go into the tomb, and you don't come out. Until God calls you out. Alright, so Job 21 verse 32, that was it. Jo John 5, let's turn to John 5. And in fact, there's another uh, story in the book of John here, John chapter 11, that talks to this point, this, this issue as well, of what happens when you die. Uh, we may touch this later on in the study here, 
Um, if not, we will. Uh, I might address it uh, later on. So let's let's go ahead and take a look here. John 5, verse 28 and 29. The Bible says here, John 5, 28 and 9, Marvel not at this, for the hour is come, coming, sorry, the hour is coming, that's future, in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. Whose voice? Well, Jesus' voice, or God's voice. And, and shall come forth, the Bible says in verse 29, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life. So wait a second. The resurrection of life, if we go to, if we go to heaven when we die, then how is there a resurrection? That don't make no sense. So notice with me as well, it says, And they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. My friends, there is a, resur there is a first resurrection by which the saints are resurrected. That can be found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where Paul talks about Jesus coming back in the clouds of glory for you and I. So, the center of the, the, the state of the dead is that Jesus is the center of the state of the dead, and that Jesus is going to come back to raise those back to life who have died in him. And those who, uh, who have done wickedly and did not believe in Jesus, did not trust in him, they will uh, go down into the grave for a thousand years until Jesus uh, comes back to this earth with the new Jerusalem and with the saints and he raises up everybody at the end of uh, at, the, at that time and they are all judged um, all right uh, give me one second here I've got to plug in my cable because it's saying that my internet is not working very well So the dead, both righteous and unrighteous, are in their graves and will hear Jesus' voice calling them forth from the grave to reward or punishment. All right, so the Bible makes it claim, plain sorry, that King David is saved. Is he in heaven now? Let's turn to Acts 2. In fact, uh, we would say that, hey, David was a pretty good guy. In fact, we call him a man after God's own heart. But where is David now? Where is David now? Acts 2.29, the Bible says, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried. Wow. Okay, that's pretty clear. And his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Wow. Okay, so that means that David, David's sepulcher, his body, was both dead and buried. And it was with Paul, or the, uh, Peter, that day when he was talking to the, the church um, at that time. That was... A couple, that was a thousand years before that David died. So David's body was there. Um, he was not, uh, he was, his body was not snatched up from the earth and taken to heaven, but rather it was remained there on earth. Notice in verse 40, 34, it says, For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. All right. So is David in heaven now? The answer is no. Based on the Bible, not based on tradition. Tradition and pastors the world over teach that when you die, you go to heaven. That is a that is a, a lie of the devil. When the devil spoke to Eve in Eden, he said, you will not surely die. And so when Eve took the fruit and sinned, he was saying, hey, you're not going to die. But it, was that a lie? Because did Adam and Eve die? I believe so. Um... So Adam and Eve died, and as well as everyone else. How many of us have lost loved ones? We've all lost loved ones, somebody that was dear to us. And, and we see their body in a casket, and but the pastor is saying that they're in heaven. Doesn't make a lot of sense in my mind. So Hebrews 11, 32 to, 30, 32 to 40, excuse me, makes it clear that all the faithful of the ages have not yet been rewarded, but rather will be rewarded together in verses 39 and 40. In fact, in 1 Thessalonians, which we'll talk about here in a minute, talks about the dead being raised up from the graves. Why would God bring them to heaven just to bring them back down and put them into their body to raise them up from the dead again? You know, if we, a little bit of thinking through this, we would understand it a lot better. So I believe that there is certainly truth in the Bible that speaks to us today about um, about God's plan for his people. But Satan has another plan. He wants you to think that 
you're going to live forever. Uh, either in hell or in heaven. But that's not truth. Who, who gets immortality? Is it the, the wicked? Because if the wicked go to hell for eternity and they're burn and burn and burn and burn, that means the, wick, the reward for the wicked is eternal life. But that's not true. Because the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord to those who are righteous. Those who keep the commandments. In Revelation chapter 22, it says that blessed are they who keep his commandments or do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life. So commandment keeping or commandment breaking is lawlessness, which is transgression of the law. Anyone who transgresses God's law is not capable of entering into heaven. They're not worthy to enter heaven. So in order to enter heaven and have eternal life and have the reward of eternal life, we must keep the commandments of God. All right. So, but isn't it true that the soul is immortal and that only the body dies? Well, we already read Ezekiel 18 verse 4, which says that the soul that sins it shall die. So that's very clear. In Job 4 verse 17, let's turn back there. Job 4 verse 17. The Bible speaks to us again, and Job is littered with scripture about the state of the dead. Now, where do the dead go when they die? Job 4 and verse 17. The Bible says here, Shall mortal man be more just than God? Ah, no. But um, shall a man be more pure than his maker? Absolutely not. 1 Timothy 6, verse 15 and 16. The Bible talks about uh, God, 1 Timothy 6, 15 and 16, it says, Which in his times he shall know, he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. All right. So the Bible says, and it's very clear, that God alone has immortality. So if God alone has immortality, then how are we given immortality how do we explain 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where it talks about uh, the, the, the dead, after the righteous, receiving immortality? Well, the way that they have immortality is that they must continue to eat from the tree of life for all eternity. In fact, the Bible talks about the tree of life in the book of Revelation chapter 21. It says that it uh, grows over the river of life, and it bears 12 manner of fruits every month. And these fruits and the leaves are for the healing of the nations. My friends, that the, those we must continue to have to trust and put our faith in God throughout eternity in order to have immortality. Because we don't have immortality in and of ourselves. The lie that Lucifer, that Satan told us and told Eve in, in Eden, was that man, that you have immortality in and of yourself. You don't need God. You don't need his law. You don't you don't have to obey the law. But my friends, if you don't obey the law of gravity, what happens? Laws aren't meant to be broken, like many people say, all rules are meant to be broken. No, they're not. Rules are, are more parental than they are uh, 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 legislative. They're parental in order to preserve us. When you, when you tell your kid, don't go, into, to, don't go into the street to play, and they ask why, well, because a car could hit you and kill you. It's the same thing with God's law. When the Bible says, when the, God's law says, thou shalt not kill, it's parental advice to saying to us, don't kill your neighbor. Don't kill your brother. Don't steal from him. Don't covet his goods. Don't covet his wife. Don't covet anything. You know, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. My friends, these are parts of God's law, and they're parental, that, that we might know best how we can relate to God and to his word. All right. So, we are souls. As we were talking about earlier, the, and souls do die. They don't go into the spirit world. They don't go into heaven. Um, rather, man is mortal. Only God is immortal. The widely believed teaching of the undying, immortal soul is not found in the Bible. The teaching is man-made. In fact, it's a, it's a twisting of the truth of God's word. Um, to say that, that, that man has an immortal soul is actually um, a tradition of, of man, and it was brought up by the by many of the philosophers of old and some of the, the, the early church fathers and others along the line. It really, just, it really came from Satan himself. That's who said it. But So when will the righteous be given immortality? Well, 1 Corinthians 15, let's turn there. We just went there just briefly. 
1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 53. It says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. All right. So in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16, I promised you that we would go to this section of Scripture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and verse 16. The Bible speaks to us here. It says, For the Lord himself shall descend with a shout, from heaven with a shout, excuse me, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So, yes, the righteous will be given immortality at the re resurrection. The wicked never receive it. So, how does the Bible repeatedly refer to death? Well, in John 11, I told you we were going to go here as well. In John 11, there was a story here about Lazarus, Jesus, one of Jesus' best friends. We lived in Bethany. Um, how does the Bible repeatedly refer to death? In John 11, 11 and verse, 14, uh, verse 11 and verse 14. Um, Jesus says, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may wake him out of sleep. Then Jesus said unto them in verse 14, Plainly, Lazarus is dead. So Jesus himself, the author of life, said that death is a sleep. That death is a sleep. Um, and, and thus we must, uh, we must trust Jesus' words. Um, so notice here Matthew 27 verse 52, and it says, The graves were open, and many bodies of the saints which died arose. Wow. 2 Samuel 7 verse 12. The Bible also talks about, it says, Thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 14. Then also which sleep in Jesus, or rest in Jesus, um, there, um, God, God, in Jesus, God, will God bring with him? Excuse me. Forgive my lisping, stammering tongue here. Um, but uh, these are important verses, friends. As we put all these together, um, we cannot mistake... Uh, the, the, the very clear application of Bibles, uh, uh, the Bible's words. That the Bible speaks verily and truly about the, 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 the state of the dead and many other things um, that we've been talking about. And we have a, a, a continued series going on here. You can just check our webpage or our Facebook page and you can see those things. So, so the Bible often refers to death as sleep. Um, what is the Bible talking about? Death is a, st uh, well, we've already talked about it, but death is a state of total unconsciousness during which 15 minutes or a thousand years seem the same. It's like when you go to bed at night. If you don't dream, you don't wake up, you just go to sleep, and next thing you know, it's four o'clock in the morning. You're like, man, I don't even feel like I slept. It just went by that fast. Um, so the dead simply sleep in their graves until the resurrection, and when all will be raised by Jesus. So the teaching of the spirits of the dead are heavenly angels, or some righteous ghost-like entity that can be contacted is without scriptural foundation. And we're about done here, but uh, Revelation 16, verse 14. Let's turn there. Revelation 16 and verse 14. All right. Since wizards, witches, and psychics cannot contact the dead, whom are they contacting? Many will claim that they are contacting the spirits of your loved ones. My friends, do not entertain witches, ghosts, wizards, psychics, fortune tellers, necromancers, or the like. They are deceivers from the pits of hell. Notice in Revelation 16, verse 14, it says, For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of the great uh, day of God Almighty. So... Um, they are the spirits of devils working. Heaven's angels are called ministering spirits in Hebrews 1, verse 14, who help people on the earth. They aid us in our lives, not in our death. The angels who were cast out of heaven with Satan, Revelation 12, verse 7 through 9, talks about that Satan drew a third of the angels with his tail. That's another topic, but um, with his lies, in essence. Um, uh, they, they are evil spirits who deceive people by working miracles. So they use all power and signs and lying wonders in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 9 and can even make fire come down from heaven in the sight of men. 
Wow, Revelation 13, verse 13. So, the devils, devils can do miracles. In fact, they can actually bring fire down out of heaven. So, the big question is, is how do we know if it's fire from God or fire from the devil? Well, that is to be determined by the words of Scripture. If they, Isaiah 8, 20 says, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So, my friends, if somebody comes claiming that they are of God... But tells you that God's law is void, that it's been nailed to the cross. We don't no longer have to keep it, um, and and uh, you know therefore you can just do whatever you want to. You know that that is not somebody from God, because it contradicts Scripture. So why does Satan want us to believe that the spirits of the dead are really alive? Matthew 24 verse 24 and 25 it says, "For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show." Great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. And he says, Behold, I have told you before, and I'm telling you again right now. My friends, do not believe the false Christ and false prophets that show signs and wonders. Signs and wonders are not a sure litmus test that it is God who is doing the work. Satan's first lie to mankind was, You shall not surely die. A preacher that tells you that you go to heaven when you die is not telling you the truth. And therefore, they are a false prophet. And you need to turn away from them. Run away from them because they are not following the scriptures. So, Satan wants people to believe that the spirits of the dead are alive so his angels can pose as saints, prophets, and righteous leaders who have died and so that he can pose as an angel of light. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 to 15 talks about Lucifer presenting himself as an angel of light. Why would he want to do that? Well, I'll tell you why. Because he wants to deceive you in order that you don't get to go to heaven. And he takes another precious soul out of God's hand. Satan hates you. He doesn't love you. He wants to destroy your life. And he's the one that's making life so difficult for you. But you don't have to, you don't have to um, uh, trust him. You don't have to worry about him because if you trust in God, excuse me, if you trust in God, God will provide you a way of escape. God will provide you um, the means that you need to get through. So it's in this way that uh, when Satan poses himself as an angel of light, that he deceives people by the millions. Utilizing these evil spirits is called spiritism or spiritualism. It is based on a two-part belief. The dead are alive. And number two, that they can contact you. Or you can contact them. In fact, one of the modern day, um, the modern day action of, um, or the modern day, um, uh, sorry, spiritism that, that, that rose up actually not too far from where we live here in New York uh, was the Fox Sisters. And they started knocking on the wall and they were talking to... Uh, what they thought was, uh, what they believed was a was a was a, a dead person, but actually ended up being a spirit. Um, this is one of Satan's most damaging pe teachings. Yet almost the whole world believes it today. The witch of Endor did not call up Samuel; rather, she was in, she saw an evil angel who posed as Samuel, and Saul said, "I perceive that it is Samuel." So, how effective will Satan's use of these evil spirits be in the last days? Well. Revelation gives us many definitive answers on this. Revelation 18, verse 23. We're going to start there. It says, And the light of the candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. That word sorceries is the word pharmakia in the Greek, where we get our word pharmacy. So, by Satan's sorceries, or pharmakia, is uh, corrupting and polluting the minds of men, the doctrines, the false doctrines that he is promoting in this world, are leading many men astray. So let's look at verse 2, Second, same chapter, Revelation 18, verse 2, and it says, And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. It's fallen twice because it's referring to Babylon in physical, the ancient Babylon, and it's also talking about spiritual Babylon. That spiritual Babylon has fallen as well. And it's become the habitation of devils. Ah, oh, devils dwell in Babylon? Yes. Absolutely. Because it is confusion. It is chaos. God is not the author of confusion, but of order. 
First Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 40, you can see that. Um, and and the, the, the Babylon is the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Wow. So, in Revelation 12, verse 9, the Bible also says that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. It's just, it's just, his whole goal is to deceive you and I, to try to lead us away from God's truth. So, by Satan's miracles or sorceries, through his evil angels, he will deceive virtually the entire world. And my friends, Lucifer, Satan, the devil, that serpent of old, is on the prowl like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And he will do anything, including uh, uh, produce false miracles to make you think that he is God in order to deceive you. So how does God regard these miracles by evil angels? Um, so Leviticus 20, verse 27, the Bible speaks to this topic um, in brief. Leviticus 20, verse 27, and it's not in brief only here, it's just where the verse is in brief. Uh, it says, A man also or a woman that hath a familiar spirit, or that is a wizard, shall surely be put to death. He shall stone them with stones, their blood shall be upon them. So, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to the seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Ephesians 5, 11 says, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. In Galatians 5, 19 through 21, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, lasciviousness idolatry, and, um, excuse me, it also says, um, forgive me, I've lost my place here. Stripes, seditions, heresies, uh, sorry, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, and the like, and it goes on and on. Um, and it says, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So, uh, Revelation 21, verse 8, the Bible says, and sorcerers shall have their part in the, the, the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Notice that uh, sorcerers will have their part in the lake of fire. But notice something else there, Revelation 21. I want to make this very clear here, because this is a very... And this is the nail in the coffin of the dead go to heaven. Notice this. Revelation 21, at the end of the chapter there, it says, uh, excuse me, uh, sorry, Revelation 20, forgive me, it's Revelation 20, and looking at verse 14. Revelation 20, verse 14, the Bible says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Now, how can hell, if it's burning, or if it's a literal place where people, souls go to die and prepares for eternity, how is hell cast into the lake of fire if hell is the lake of fire? You got some thought there? I'm just being silent for effect there. But death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. If death and hell are cast into the lake of fire, that means hell really means the grave. That means death and the grave were cast in the lake of fire. There will be no, be no more grave. So what glorious power does God offer his people? Last question here. I know we got a, I'm about done here. What glorious power does God offer his people? Philippians 3 verse 10. Let's turn there. Philippians chapter 3. It's in the New Testament just before uh, the book of uh, 1 Thessalonians and uh, Colossians. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10. Bible says here that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his, of his sufferings be made conformable unto his death. What Satan does by saying that the dead go to heaven when they die is that he makes void the power of God's, of Christ's resurrection, of the power of Christ's resurrecting po power. I'm sorry, I'm saying, repeat myself there. But the power of his resurrection is that he has the power to raise the dead to life. And that is amazing. So, And we have the opportunity to know him who has all power. So Jesus offers us the same power to live right that raised him from the dead. That is wonderful news, friends. So how can we fail with such incredible power given to us? And that with no cost to us. Jesus, because he loves us, solemnly warns us away from the power and miracles of evil angels. 
and offers to work the divine miracles needed to prepare us for his kingdom. My friends, the Bible is very clear about what happens when we die. Be not deceived, because God has given us the truth in his word. We just need to go to the word of God. We need to, um, we need to test the spirits. We need to test the word of God to see whether it's so. Don't just believe anyone off the street or somebody who says that they, they claim to have the power of, of, of bringing conjuring spirits. And it's very real and alive today. And there are many people out there who are atheists and agnostics that actually talk to spirits, but they will not admit it in, in, out in, in, in public because uh, they're getting benefits by teaching the things that they teach. They're getting money. They're getting great riches and wealth and, and fame and, uh, and, and fortune. My friends, God doesn't work that way. God wants to save you, and he wants to save you by a personal choice, a personal relationship with him. And I just want to close with this, that if, if, if it is your desire to follow Jesus, because you understand that Jesus was resurrected from the dead, just like the dead uh, uh, dead in humanity, the righteous dead of humanity, will be raised up at, at the end, um, we can know through Jesus' power who he is and what he has done for us. And I, I believe that... that um, Many of us are searching for truth, searching for answers, searching for help um, in, in this day. Uh, and my friends, Jesus offers truth. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And we need to follow that truth. Um, if it's, even if it's the, the, the hardest thing that we've ever done. My friends, truth, the truth will set you free, but first it will make you mad. All right, my friends, uh, this is going to conclude our, our time together, breaking the, the word of God, breaking the bread of God. And so let's conclude with a word of prayer. And I want to pray for you tonight that if you're struggling with this in your life about uh, where the dead go, or maybe you have uh, dealings with spirits, or maybe you're a practicing witch or somebody of that nature, or maybe you've got, you're confused about all these things, I want to pray for you and ask the Lord to give you understanding and wisdom to help you to go to his word, to find the truth. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your word that gives us hope, that gives us light, that gives us truth, Lord. We ask and pray that you would be with us as in our search for truth, as we uh, walk through this journey of life on this earth, Lord. Father, it is such a beautiful doctrine, such a beautiful truth that the dead sleep and they're not tormented in hell, that they're not living in heaven, looking down upon us, and, and they can't come and talk to us? That doesn't make any sense, Lord. But that, I mean, how much more should we be careful? If our loved ones are in heaven, should we be living according to the standard that you have given us? That they don't have to look down and say, wow, I can't believe they're doing that in their lives. But Father, I pray that you would help us to look to you, look to your truth, look to your word, Lord. That, you, that we may understand what it is you're trying to tell us. Father, this is part of your truth. That... That you said that the dead sleep, that the dead's reward, or that the, the reward of wickedness is death, not eternal life. And so, Father, we ask and pray that tonight as we conclude our study, that you would bless each one. Any, and anyone who comes across this study, may they be blessed by it. May they come to an understanding of what it means to walk with you. And I pray, Father, that if there is somebody who is struggling, who is, who is sucked in by the, the vices of, of spiritualism, that you would set them free just now. And that they would be that they would be that they would live for you. And Father, we just thank you so much for this study tonight and for your word. That is always true. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Alright, my friends, God bless, and we'll see you very soon. We're not going to be having a breaking bread for some time, but uh, we will be back probably in July. So have a good night and may the Lord bless and keep you.